Welcome back to another video here on the channel and this one has been anticipated by a bunch of you guys. We are finally talking about the Lightning Network. I've been talking about it a little bit here and there in different videos, but it's time to really double down and get the gist of it. So here's what we look at. First, what is the Lightning Network and why does it exist? How does it work? We won't get too technical here as it becomes very complicated very quickly. We also look at the growth and recent trends, wallets and nodes, as well as different Lightning applications, current and potential problems and possible solutions. And this video is quite long, so you can also use the video description to jump to different chapters of the video in case you're only interested in one part of it and not the whole thing. So let's get started with the what and why of the Lightning Network. The Lightning Network is described in its white paper as follows. A decentralized system is proposed whereby transactions are sent over a network of micropayment channels, also known as payment channels or transaction channels, whose transfer of value occurs off blockchain. Whereas the Bitcoin white paper is just 9 pages long, the Lightning one counts 59 pages. It starts by explaining why Lightning is necessary in the first place. The blockchain scalability issue. Every blockchain faces the trilemma of scalability, decentralization and security. It's not possible to optimize all three axes at once. Bitcoin has made the decision to optimize for decentralization and security. These features are absolutely crucial for Bitcoin to be a censorship resistant network with unchangeable rules with the least attack vectors possible. And other cryptos take different trade-offs. This is the fundamental problem. No altcoin is better than Bitcoin in every regard. They just optimize for other elements and in my opinion Bitcoin has made the correct trade-offs. But what are they? Well, one of them surely is missing scalability. Scaling to billions of users on the base layer is not possible without compromising decentralization and or security. And not only that, with a higher usage of the base layer, transaction fees rise, which makes small payments uneconomical. If each node in the Bitcoin network must know about every single transaction that occurs globally, that may create a significant drag on the ability of the network to encompass all global financial transactions. It would instead be desirable to encompass all transactions in a way that doesn't sacrifice the decentralization and security that the network provides. And so a scaling solution is absolutely vital for Bitcoin to reach mainstream adoption. Many ideas were discussed throughout the years, but Lightning is the one that really remained. The white paper introduced the basic idea in very interesting fashion that is easy to understand. If a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? If nobody hears the tree fall, whether it made a sound or not is of no consequence. Similarly in the blockchain, if only two participants care about an everyday recurring transaction, it's not necessary for all the other nodes in the Bitcoin network to know about that transaction. It is instead preferable to only have the bare minimum of information on the blockchain. By deferring telling the entire world about every transaction, doing net settlement of their relationship at a later date enables Bitcoin users to conduct many transactions without bloating up the blockchain or creating trust in a centralized counterparty. The analogy you will often hear is a coffee transaction. If I'm buying a cup of coffee at a local cafe in Paris, does a fitness coach in Los Angeles or a comedian in New York need to know about this transaction? Because that's how the blockchain works, the base layer of Bitcoin. Transactions are publicly broadcasted. This of course means that there is a lot of information flowing around when you would include all the world's transactions. Lightning enables peer-to-peer -peer payments that happen off-chain through payment channels between individuals. Once the involved parties close their channels, a final settlement occurs on the blockchain to ultimately settle who owns what. This is why the Lightning Network is called a second layer, similar to how Visa or Mastercard are higher layers on top of the existing financial system. Lightning can scale to millions of transactions per second, while transactions are almost free. You pay fractions of a cent to send money across the world, instantly. That sounds pretty amazing, right? So how does it work? The Lightning Network is not a blockchain, sidechain or anything like that. Instead, it's a peer-to-peer -peer mesh network, a network in which all nodes are equal with no central party, that uses Bitcoin's consensus rules to finalize transactions. Let's walk through it step by step. I want to send money to someone. We call him Bob, as every computer scientist in history would. My name is not Alice by the way, but let's keep going. To send funds to Bob over the Lightning Network, we need to open a payment channel with each other. This payment channel is essentially a multi-signature address used from the Bitcoin network. These multi-sig addresses are quite fascinating. In the Lightning case, they are two of two addresses, which means both people involved need to sign a transaction if they want to send funds from this address. You can think of this multi-signature address as a treasure that you both have one key to. But to open it, you both need to be present because both keys are necessary. To open the channel with Bob, I also need to add the so-called funding transaction, which means I specify how much liquidity or how many satoshis I want to have in the payment channel. I'm sending 100,000 satoshis to the multisig address. At this point, there are a few things to note. 
First, the funding transaction is a regular transaction on the blockchain, which means that fees apply. I can do as many transactions with the 100k satoshis back and forth with Bob as I want and also have them as small as I want for a few satoshis or even zero satoshis per transaction. Secondly, it also means that I will not be able to send more than 100,000 satoshis to Bob. There is no credit system or anything like that. And third, the multisig address or payment channel keeps track of the balance between us two. Right now I have 100k satoshis in the channel which is also called the local balance while Bob has zero, known as the remote balance. If I send him 10k satoshis, he now has them and I have 90k satoshis left. The sending of funds happens by creating a transaction that has two outputs. One output is the 90k satoshis that I essentially send to myself and the other are the 10k satoshis that go to Bob. I sign this transaction and once Bob signed it, the balance has been adjusted. An important side note, no one knows of this transaction besides Bob and me. It's a completely peer-to-peer -peer transaction with no one else involved. We will look into how Lightning enhances privacy again later on. When Bob and I decide to close our channel, we have the last state of the balance settled publicly on the blockchain, so we are back on the base layer. Now if you think about it, does this really seem practical? I mean, I need to open the payment channel with Bob, pay the fees on the blockchain, wait for the block confirmations and so on. What's the point? It doesn't really seem to be cheap or instant either. But of course, there is more to it. Just like in Bitcoin, network effects strike again. The point is that it gets really interesting when you want to send Satoshis to someone you don't have a channel with. What you do is you use one of your peers who has a channel with your recipient. And you actually don't send your recipient the funds directly, because they are locked in the channel. Instead, you basically tell your channel partner that he should send funds to your end recipient and you will give him the same amount in your payment channel with him. You also add a small fee, the so-called routing fee, so that your channel partner has an incentive to do the transaction for you. This all works under the hood without you needing to do anything and is completely trustless because of the nature of the involved hash time locked contracts. A hash time locked contract is a type of smart contract used in blockchain applications to eliminate counterparty risk by enabling the implementation of time bound transactions. In practical terms, this means that recipients of a transaction have to acknowledge payment by generating cryptographic proof within a certain time frame. Otherwise, the transaction does not take place. Hash time lock contract is also a term you should remember in case you want to sound sophisticated. Going back to the mentioned privacy, you actually don't even know whose channels you are using, because it's all behind Onion and Tor's privacy technologies. Breaking the Lightning network has the same bounty as breaking the Monero network, which is supposedly the strongest privacy coin. Through the Taproot upgrade in November, even the settlement on the blockchain will have a huge privacy gain, because a multisig transaction from a closing Lightning channel will look the same as a regular transaction. This also shows how Lightning is non-custodial. It's just a multisig address with no one else in charge. And it already makes one thing clear. The Lightning network becomes way more useful the more nodes are involved. This was about as technical as we get in this video. If you want to dig deeper into how the protocol works, I can highly recommend Andreas Antonopoulos' YouTube presentation A Technical Introduction to the Lightning Network at We Are Developers 2020. The link is in the video description. Now let's talk a little bit about the growth of the Lightning Network. Recently, there have been many really good news. A big one, of course, was El Salvador announcing Bitcoin as legal tender, which will come into effect in a few days and will very much depend on the Lightning Network. More and more exchanges embrace Lightning, like Paxful, Kraken and OKX. Lightning Labs raised another $10 million to contribute to the protocol and Substack announced they will accept payments through Lightning. Our partnership will allow content creators across the Substack ecosystem to accept Bitcoin payments and retain earnings in Bitcoin or convert to preferred currency. Writers and podcasters have flocked to Substack to regain creative and financial freedom and Bitcoin is a natural fit. It actually simply looks like all the relevant numbers are going up. Nodes, channels, capacity. These are the growth stats from the last 30 days. And I mean, just look at this graph. This looks very promising. It's no longer just the future. Lightning is here. In an article called The Lightning Network is Approaching Its Suddenly Moment, referring to the gradually then suddenly nature of technology and protocols, Marty Band wrote the following. The obviousness of the superiority of the BTC LN stack to facilitate native payments on the web is going to be so glaring that there is going to be a flood of adoption driven by companies looking to inject sets into products. And it could very much be true. Are we reaching a tipping point? What do you think? In short, the Lightning Network has come very far in the last several months and seems poised to only go up from here. When more businesses start accepting Bitcoin in daily life, the infrastructure provided by the Lightning Network will be crucial in making this dream a reality. But don't worry, I'll leave the hype train soon enough to talk about the existing problems of Lightning, but the growth and development of this open source protocol deserves some celebration through poor bullishness. 
You can check out a nice graph view of the Lightning Network on allenrouter.app slash graph. It's also visualized which nodes have how many payment channels. Before talking about different Lightning applications, and there are already a ton of them, I want to briefly cover different node implementations and wallets in general that get you started. The easiest custodial solution is probably Wallet of Satoshi, which is available for iOS and Android. It's a centralized service though that stores your Bitcoin. I of course prefer non-custodial wallets. Popular ones include Phoenix, Moon, Breeze, Blue Wallet and many more. Although the last one is not non-custodial by default when it comes to Lightning as far as I'm aware. Not your keys, not your coins applies to Lightning just as much as it does to Bitcoin. For small payments you send to friends where you don't necessarily need full privacy, censorship resistance and all the other great Bitcoin features, custodial wallets can be a good starting point to learn about Lightning transactions, invoices and more. They often have a superior user experience as you need to worry less about what's going on under the hood. If you want to go next level though, you should consider running a Bitcoin and Lightning node, which is very easy to do nowadays. Running Umbral on a Raspberry Pi is extremely straightforward and literally only takes a few minutes to set up. BTC Sessions also did a fantastic video on how to run a Lightning node. Umbral also has an app store that offers a few apps that you can use for better channel and liquidity management, data visualizations, etc. Speaking of apps, there are a growing number of them that make use of the Lightning network and some of them are quite game-changing. The best example is Strike, which plays an important role in El Salvador and I expect it to become a worldwide phenomenon pretty quickly. Strike enables real-time currency changes, meaning you can send dollars from the US around the world instantly with no fees using the Lightning Network and the recipient in Germany receives Euros. It works by buying Bitcoin with dollars, sending the Bitcoin through the Lightning Network and then selling them for Euros at the destination, all within a second. This is pretty world-changing stuff all possible because of the open nature of the network that is completely interoperable. I showed the following clip before, but I will show it again, because when you understand it, it reveals what's possible with an open network that everyone can build on. I mean, we manage, we have so many nodes all over the world. Uh, it's easy again. I mean, this is money that is software. If there's something that's missing, we just build it. I mean, you really want to bet against engineering and betting against engineering is betting against humanity and human life itself so no we just build it against jack Mallers. yeah and, and here's the other cool thing is you know we have our own lightning setup but you know there's a company bottle pay that seems to be operating a similar service if a user wants to send money from strike to bottle pay they can why did we come up with some way to communicate that paypal and cash app didn't no we're on the same open monetary network, right? Lightning itself is open source. You can build implementations of the network yourself and there exist more than one, like LND, Eclair or C Lightning, that are all interoperable with each other through the Bolt protocol. In fact, Lightning is quite independent from Bitcoin. You could also build it on top of Ethereum or other cryptos. They just need multisig features as well as hash time locks. Another interesting app is Sphinx Chat, which is a real-time chat in which you can also send Lightning payments instantly. And the huge advantage is that it benefits from the Lightning privacy. The chat is completely invisible to others, not even Signal or Telegram can keep up. Twitter is also thinking about integrating Lightning into either Twitter itself or the coming decentralized standard called Blue Sky. After all, Jack wants Bitcoin to become the native currency of the internet. Twitter would be a great place to start to expose millions upon millions of users to Lightning. When a Twitter user asked Jack about this specifically, the Twitter CEO just replied, only a matter of time. You could also use BitRefill or Fold to purchase many different gift cards through Lightning that you can then use in the respective shops, or use Moon to pay with Lightning wherever Visa debit cards are accepted, leaving the Bitcoin standard becomes easier every day. Something else that is not even possible with the current banking system is money streaming. With Lightning you could pay for a service by the second and instantly send the funds for it without any batching. This could create new business models for streaming content, playing video games in the cloud or whatever else you can think of. It's quite impossible to give you a list of all the Lightning applications as the list just keeps growing. Second and third layer applications will solve UX problems and enhance the Bitcoin network while retaining its security model, unchangeable consensus rules and value propositions. And yes, I agree, that all sounds too good to be true. So what are the problems? First things first, Lightning is neither feature complete nor completely ready to go mainstream. After all, it's a complex new technology that's still in its infancy or experimental stage. What many developers will tell you is that there are many problems ahead, and these are technically hard problems, but they are not unsolvable problems, otherwise it wouldn't make sense for a developer to contribute to Lightning in the first place. One issue is channel liquidity, the limits that come with it and the associated user experience. 
It's not really intuitive that you need to open a channel with someone that you prefill with liquidity before you can start transacting with that person. But again, this problem becomes less of a problem the more nodes and routes exist in the network. Every part of the route needs to have sufficient liquidity to perform the transaction though. If I want to send 100k sets to someone and in between there is a node that doesn't have 100k sets in the payment channel to the next recipient, the whole road is not valid, because it becomes infeasible to reach the end recipient. It's very easy to see how this makes slightly larger payments harder to perform. Often criticized are the centralization risks that can occur. There can be super nodes or hubs that wrote many of the payments and thereby act like banks, being fully custodial. While this is against the decentralized nature of Bitcoin and Lightning, it doesn't imply that these hubs control the network. They just offer services. Just like Amazon AWS and Google offer services that you can use, but you can also run your own server. So the best way to circumvent this fear is running your own node and open channels. A more speculative take that is voiced and lies somewhere between Lightning and Bitcoin itself is the potential danger that almost fee-less transactions on the Lightning network lead to a weakened security of the base layer, because the miners earn less. Well, on top of that you could argue that every halving is reducing the security of the base layer because miner rewards get lower, yet hash rate has gone up because of a rising Bitcoin price. In the end, I believe the market will find a balance of what to settle over Lightning and what to settle over the base layer, and fees will adjust accordingly with the security. For example, fees could be higher because opening and closing payment channels is a useful action. An issue that still clearly exists but hopefully becomes less prevalent is not being able to find routes. This of course becomes more easy with more nodes and liquidity available. On the other hand, routing while keeping up privacy is one of the technically hard problems in general. Because nodes can also lie about being able to route payments and wait for the timeout of the request. Just a month ago, however, René Picard and Stefan Richter published a paper with the title Optimally Reliable and Cheap Payment Flows on the Lightning Network, in which they argue they found the provable optimal routing solution. So as you can see, a lot of research is going on on that ground. In Lightning, there can be the brass paradox when it comes to routes and the associated liquidity. Brass paradox is the observation that adding one or more routes to a road network can slow down overall traffic flow through it. Another problem is that Lightning nodes need to be online all the time, or at least most of the time, otherwise you can't react to fraud attempts. Sure, there are time locks, so your node can be offline for some time, but if you miss the time lock you can't react to a fraudulent forced channel closing. A possible solution to this issue are so-called watchtowers, a third party that is watching over your transactions. This however leads to another potential problem. They could also be spying actors that want to gain transactional informations for marketing purposes etc. So far it seems to be a game of trade-offs once again. Privacy is a double-edged sword. If you don't know who sends money to whom, you also don't recognize potential attackers easily. This also means that in Lightning you always have a hot wallet and not cold storage, which is not the greatest for security reasons. Now speaking of attackers or attacks specifically, there are a bunch of them, like flute and loot or griefing attacks. Flute and loot is a systemic attack. One of the risks that was identified early on is that of a wide systemic attack on the protocol in which an attacker triggers the closure of many lightning channels at once. The resulting high volume of transactions in the blockchain will not allow for the proper settlement of all debts and attackers may get away with stealing some funds. And this attack vector is real, but there are mitigation strategies that are being worked on at this moment. Circuit breaker, which is still in an alpha stage, could be one element in that equation. Circuit breaker is to lightning what firewalls are to the internet. It allows nodes to protect themselves from being flooded with HTLCs. With circuit breaker, a maximum to the number of in-flight HTLCs can be set on a per-peer basis. Known and trusted peers, for example, can be assigned a higher maximum, while a new channel from a previously unseen node may be limited to only a few pending HTLCs. Griefing attacks have a similar pattern. They don't involve stealing funds, but simply spamming channels with HTLCs, which frees the funds of the victim and he might need to force close the channel which involves a fee. The attacker saturates one or several channels with hash time lock contracts that don't resolve as a finalized payment. These are a special breed of HTLCs known as HODL invoices. Only 483 of these unresolved HTLCs are required to overwhelm a channel per direction. Once those HTLCs are in the channel, any transactions using that same channel direction are impossible, including a transaction to cooperatively close the channel. Demanding a ransom to stop the attack or disrupting a route to lead others over the attacker's route could be motives of the attacker. Limiting the amount of HTLCs on a per peer basis again seems to be the solution. However, the intrinsic privacy of the network makes this harder. Sure, you can restrict the numbers of HLCs from a peer who seems to spam you, but you have no idea if he is the attacker himself or if he's just routing the attack from someone else. 
Just to make one thing clear, I'm not trying to whitewash these attack vectors. They do exist and there are not easy instant fixes for them. And also, a lot of problems we don't even know of yet will be found in the future. However, throwing engineers and computer scientists at the problems helps a ton to keep confident that solutions will be found. After this list of problems and issues, we can go back to where I started this section. In my opinion, the Lightning Network is not ready for mainstream adoption yet. El Salvador will be an interesting test scenario. Many features are still missing and many errors still occur. It's just a few years old and therefore still in an experimental stage. However, I certainly remain hopeful that Lightning brings the desired scalability. The recent growth and rising awareness are supporting this hope. And I think that's a good closure to this video. Now, what are your thoughts on the Lightning Network? Are you using it? Are you maybe even running a node? What do you think about the problems and solutions that I mentioned, as well as the recent growth? If you enjoyed the video and learned something from it, I would also highly appreciate it if you leave a like and subscribe to the channel for further content. And then I see you next time.